Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Contact Lost and another episode of Post WTC Interviews. Um, I'm your host today, uh, Joker, and with me today I've got one of our more common guests, and that is Pumba. Hi, mate. Hello, hello. Good to nice have to you be on back. again. Yeah, yeah very nice to be stuff. back. Right, so um, we're going to talk about your performance at the WTC. First of all, congrats on the second place finish. Thank you very and, much. And um, to begin with, uh, maybe what are your initial thoughts about the event itself? So um, to summarize, I think the event was actually amazing. I th genuinely think uh, that was one of the best experiences, not only in like my hobby career, hobby life, let's say, but generally one of the best experiences of my life. I would be willing to say that, yes. Uh, the, the general atmosphere of the event, the camaraderie across the teams, the general vibe of, of, of just people playing uh, Warhammer um, on the best competitive level is just amazing. And all, meeting all the people you know from like playing online on TTS or from um, refereeing UK events, stuff like this, it was just so nice to see everybody there. So wow. generally extremely pleasant, extremely nice, uh, amazing to be honest, just amazing. Oh, sounds like it was all you'd have hoped for and even more than that. That is very much true, yes. I think on the on the like the event side, the, the, the whole thing was just phenomenal. Okay, well, that's that's really good to hear. Uh, I mean, especially given uh, people in our Discord were a bit sceptical prior to the event, if I remember correctly. Uh, yep. I, I mean, I was one of them, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> we are both a little bit anxious how it's going to go and how the, the, the event's going to be run and stuff like this, but generally it was very nicely done, well organized, stuff like this, so. Good, good stuff. Well, that is really good to hear. I mean, an event of this scale that happens once a year, you really want it to be the best thing it can be. Um, so anyway, moving on, and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit of what you played at the WTC? How much of your choice it was <laughs> to play that? <laughs> How did it happen? What was the you role? You already know what is coming. You already know what's coming. You're <laughs> I do, that's you. why I'm, I'm laughing asking the question as well. So. <laughs> You're baiting me into this question. Oh my God. So into the boring part of the interview, here we go. Um, so uh, to begin with, I was playing an uh, incredible list, uh, very well thought out and extremely interesting and um, like um, one of the lists that just makes you think all the time. <laughs> uh, so that was 36 goddamn uh, Tyranid Leviathan Warriors. It was an obnoxious just um, blob and mass of uh, critical mass basically of warriors that was meant to swarm your opponent, uh, score big on primary, especially allowing you to gain some points from secondaries along the way, even though Tyranids don't have the best secondaries. Um, by taking the whole board, you could pro probably still score um, some nice points there, and then trying to survive as long as possible while uh, disallowing your opponent to uh, regain the board control as, as long as possible. And even if that happened along the way, you probably have already scored enough to win the game. So that was my basic game plan. That was what we've, um, let's say, we've designed. I think it's important to notice here that it was not the um, like a list that I've completely designed myself. It was a list um, that has been a conclusion of many, many uh, talks and, and tests done by our community some of the great people that helped me developing this after the Nephilim changes. So even though the list is kind of obnoxious and is quite a slog to play, it's not very interesting. It's kind of like presenting your opponent with a math problem more than um, maybe outplaying them on the table. Uh, it worked really, really well, to be honest. So 
uh, credits where credits where credit is due. Uh, that was absolutely the correct choice of the list. I think it worked perfectly in our pairing process and on the table itself. Um, okay, well, um, turn it's view like an option that actually has quite a bit of options. Um, so did because that sounds like a bit of a skewed list and uh, where I'm getting at is would it be viable for a singles event in your opinion or would you need to throw out some of the warriors for example to bring in something that deals more damage or what have you um I think as most of the WTC um, design lists, especially for 8v8 team format, it doesn't really work pay perfectly in singles. It's not as bad as some of the other skill lists that I would never bring to the singles event. I think you can absolutely take it, and if you have some lack in the pairings process, you can do well. However, the list has two major issues. It plays, it doesn't play against Tau, nor does it play against Hell of Doom. These are the two lists that are very common. Um, maybe Tau is very common in Poland. Mm, Hail of Doom, not so much, but on the other hand, uh, it is very common in the like, Western part of the world and, and other events, global events. So in that sense, it doesn't really work well into that meta full of these two armies. Other than that, it can actually play very nicely against everything else. Um, it doesn't rely on the table choice at all, basically. So it's very um, forgiving in that sense. So if you're playing on like um, terrain that's not dense enough for some combat armies, uh, this list doesn't really care about that. But I definitely wouldn't recommend it just taking the list as it is to any singles event, no. Okay. And um, how does that... How did uh, that list fit into the team composition? What was it aimed at uh, in the pairings process? Um, basically, it was there was a couple of reasons why we chose that specific list over something like Blood Angels that we have considered um, as an eighth army to our team comp or something to fill out the slot. Um, one of the big reasons is the fact that we have already gathered a strong army composition that relied on table choices. So we had armies like uh, Drukari being our defender most of the time. We had two knights, which both um, kind of require you to have at least some degree of table choice or to thin out the table choices across the board so they then got uh, stuck on the tables that just um, disallow them to leave their deployment zone easily or in which they can be blocked easily. Uh, we had Sisters, another army that uh, relaxed their table choice. We had Tau, of course, mm, so another army that probably some, well, sometimes, of course, not always will want the table choice. So he had, came to the conclusion we need something that is table agnostic, that can play on any table and attack most of the lists. And some of the lists that we knew are going to come up are a Blood Angels specifically, um, things like sisters or even knights. All of these I would consider to be pretty good pairings for that specific list. Um, and especially if that list goes first, it can swarm, definitely swarm you off the table and just gain huge advantage this way over those combat oriented armies or armies that can get blocked like knights. Okay, um, part of the reason I was asking is for well, was, this is obviously very interesting. I remember that we had Tiffus once the lists were live and uh, he mentioned offline, which because it was kind of secret at the time that um, the list was kind of aimed at baiting out Harlequins as well. Uh, would you Harlequins, say that's absolutely. a good matchup? Yes, that was definitely a thing that was on my, our mind when choosing the list. It didn't really occur to me now because we played against only one team that had Harlequins in their composition. But yes, if that that was a big a reason why we took it as well, it definitely dealt very nicely with, uh, like, say, the Harlequins. It was something they just couldn't chew through and get they would get swarmed and mortal wounded to oblivion. 
Okay, and um, uh, can you tell us anything about other Tyranid lists? Did a lot of teams have Tyranids and did a lot of teams also bring warrior spam filled to the brim? I think most common archetype still uh, was the Levith uh, Leviathan two warrior blobs with a flyer and probably a walker and, but that's optional uh, most of the time. That was an arch uh, two harpies were the absolute standard in almost all of the lists. So I think uh, we definitely, I've played a mirror against um, that kind of list uh, that Belgium ran. I think Ines, uh, the team, cap uh, team Scotland captain, was running the precise archetype that he has practiced for a long, long time. However, in our testing, mm, that list didn't really work anymore. The problem was if um, we played against a good, very good, uh, very practiced opponent that knew how to deal with uh, with it, mainly playing very aggressive upfront game with the trained warriors, they could actually melt really fast. The problem is that list um, lost a lot of CPs after the Nephilim changes, along of course with the secondary changes that hit them pretty um, pretty substantially, I would say. But the main issue was definitely the CPs. So you had the both the Warriors and the Flyrant, and you were probably starting with uh, one, sometimes zero CPs even. Um, so the situation was you often couldn't afford to give the Warriors proper uh, stratagem support in the uh, in the sense you couldn't give them like minus one damage plus one attack uh, or uh, plus one to hit from Feshuk's stratagem and at the same time have enough CPs uh, to get the fly around online so to buff him up to uh, generate additional attacks to reroll the wounds and probably then fly out um, and get back to your Tyrant Guard with the overrun stratagem. Basically, all that that list went after it went online, after it generated uh, throughout the games and FCPs, it was very good and still did amazing things. But after a very um, sorry, um, but after testing uh, and after playing against very competent opponents that he knew exactly what to do against it, it was still susceptible to being just wiped off the board in the first turns. So that was the problem that we encountered. And that was the basically the most basic um, list that occurred in WTC in case of Tyranids. The other archetype, I think, was something like uh, Kraken Ravener Spam that uh, Eng the English brought. I don't think actually it performed super well for them. And that was also the case in our testing that the list is kind of susceptible to many, many things and doesn't perform as well as, as we would expect it to. The Germans definitely brought some interesting stuff in this in this amazing like um, out there mortal wound spammy list with two harpies, like nine zoanthropes, three neuros or something with Mala Scepter, that was something completely out there, which I don't think many people expected and many teams got caught on. Okay, yeah, that one sounds like an interesting one. Yep, that is much. definitely one that people should like take notice of because I think it's incredibly well designed. Okay, um, thanks for those insights. I was going to ask uh, why didn't you take the fly run? Because that seems like one of the more efficient models in the entire game. But I mean, you've uh, already laid that out, so no need to further dwell on it. Okay, um, I think we can go into the games now. So uh, why don't you tell us about game number one against Belgium, which I think you've already mentioned was a turn mirror. That was a turn mirror. That was also a turn Leviathan mirror. So my opponent, Dag, um, who was an incredibly uh, incredible gentleman that I've had a lot of fun playing against, he was running this uh, very typical double harpy fly around, walk around, two blobs of warrior list. Mm. Generally, I would expect this matchup to be very drawish, a little dependent on who goes first and has the first uh, opportunity to get his buffs online. 
I did start that game. Um, I did roll pretty well on my uh, shooting in the first turn. I gained uh, control over the middle of the board and tried to push him out to um, deny him some primary points. Uh, however, at the later stages of the game, uh, because I wasn't fast enough to actually chew through all the warriors and all of the other stuff uh, controlling the objectives, even though I did outscore him in the first uh, half of the game, let's say, to deny him some primary points and as well as some secondary points, I wasn't fast enough to actually push him before the, uh, as I've said, the flyer and, and the warrior and the CPs went online. So in the later stages, when the flyer went online, he was pretty good at killing warriors with the roll all to wound stratagem. So basically, he pushed me to the other side. But after I've completed my push and then was wiped, the K, the game ended in a perfect draw. So a 10-10 draw with like some little, very little uh, point differential or on either side. So basically, as expected. Okay, um, so not too much history there. Uh. I mean, uh, it was a very nice game, but yeah, uh, when two like complete cock block lists beat each other, that is kind of the result you are expecting, unless something goes terribly wrong. All right, um, well, uh, in that case, so and how did that game finish overall? Uh, it was a draw, wasn't it? Yes, against Belgium. We drew against Belgium. He uh, had some trouble. I mean, the main problem was some of our pairings that were marked as green uh, actually weren't. As it turned out, that was kind of the case. We didn't have enough tests in to test them 100% properly. Um, so we held only a draw for a starter, which wasn't the best result, I would say. I think uh, everybody from the team would agree we expected to win that matchup. However, it didn't uh, like discourage us to continue. Okay, uh, so that was also the first game of the pod round. So the second one was against. That was against Denmark. Denmark. And uh, how did the pairings go? Maybe let's start from the beginning. The pairings um, against Denmark. I think the pairings this time went uh, completely like well as expected basically so we didn't have except for our uh usual suspects like Drukari or uh i think the other matchup that wasn't so hot for us was like uh, maybe sisters of battle mirror but other than our Drukari eating the uh danish tyranids which they were expected to do in many of our uh, pairing process, processes and matchups, uh, the other were looking very good. I got myself a nice Blood Angels dinner for the afternoon, uh, and on the especially because of the mission that was played, because I think that was mission 11, and so a very narrow one. I did manage to beat the Blood Angels like 18-2, I think, after not starting the pairing. Basically, the, the, the list operates in a very um, push-heavy way then, but you, what, what is crucial, I think, in this pairing is just disallowing Blood Angels charging across your whole army. What you do is just above one unit up, push it across the table, and present your opponent with, uh, with an, like a question that he cannot answer easily. So either you go into that buffed up um, terrain warrior unit that just threatens your whole deployment zone with the whole of your army, or you just ignore them and then it charges you. So after he has charged that terrain warrior, uh, that one buffed up unit, he then got just swarmed and wiped by the rest of the army. It was basically exactly as planned. Okay. Uh, and uh, I understand you did win that game. That was, yes, that was an 18-2 for me. Uh, and overall, yeah, uh, team wise. Yeah, team wise, we also did pretty well. I cannot, for the love of me, remember the exact score, but that was definitely over a 100 win for us. Okay, so, and the uh, last game of day one? 
The last day of game of day one, that was Switzerland, I believe. Mm. So I got myself uh, a Renegade Knights. A Renegade Knights list uh, running the... Whatchamacallit? Is it the Desecrator? I think this is Desecrator. The, uh, the big guy with, uh, the, with, the, with the big gun. gun. Exactly. It's the Desecrator, yeah. It is the Desecrator which I would consider to be one of the worst models in 40k that is being actually played by someone. <laughs> I think it is absolutely horrendous. You should never play one in your uh, Chaos Knights list, and that's a hot take for me. Uh, that opinion did not change after this game, because it rolled will really well in our game, so he killed like four warriors, and that was, um, that was this guy for 400 points, and his uh, Space Marine Captain Aura. Uh, generally, I think that was a good matchup for me. I played it kind of similarly to the Blood Angels matchup, um, although I definitely waited a little bit more to actually push him, push onto his objectives, thinning him out uh, before rushing in with Mortal Wound spam. I had uh, two units of Zontropes that were specifically designed to handle those kinds of situations. So every time the any kind of knight just came forward, he would just get obliterated by mortal wounds. Uh, so that definitely helped me out there. Um, other than that, after like killing three, four knights in the first turn with just shooting and mortal wound spam, then I decided to push forward and uh, took one flank and his deployment zone marker. And the game generally ended with almost a table for me. I mean, uh, I tabled my opponent, and the final score came down to like 19-1, I believe. So that was also very successful. Okay, so not a bad day one. Yep. After all, we we finished, we, we smashed the, the Swiss, I think, more than 120 points there. So we had two bi very big scores after uh, day one and one uh, draw with Belgium. So that was under our uh, like under our below our expectations, but definitely we were not out of it. Yeah. So um, how did you guys feel after uh, after that day one? Because like you said, that was a bit below the expectations. Because obviously you were going for. The three wins the first day. So, um, did it impact your morale in any way, or I mean, after the evening the, in general? Yeah, yeah. The thing is, we were so tired after the first day. Uh, we finished playing at like 10:30 p.m. and get, got to actually leave the venue around 11. So basically, we arrived at our place at midnight, and after playing three games of top level 40k everybody was just absolutely dead <laughs> at this point so i guess that actually might have helped us in a way because we didn't have like a lot of time to um, dwell over things instead we just knew we had to focus and just smash the rest of the competition and just our plan was then very very simple after the first game i think we talked uh, with each other in the sense that, all right, that was our speed bump. But we cannot allow our, ourselves any more of that, so we just need to win everything. <laughs> and if we do, that's going to be pretty good, right? And we still can absolutely make it. Okay. Um, so, uh, did you know who you were going to play the next morning, or was that secret or something? No, no, no. We knew we were playing against Germany. The information came through uh, like after we arrived at the hotel, I think, on BCP. Mm -hmm. So um, we already knew what our uh, planned pairing was. Uh, we had the tables ready from our preparation time uh, that before the event. So now the thing was uh, like double checking our estimations, I guess, and deciding our defenders, stuff like that. So we were prepared for the next day, um, like checking the pairings uh, because now we knew what the mission was going to be after uh, like against those specific lists and if that might impact our estimations in that sense. But basically we done uh, some 
we spent a little time on that, but we were quite prepared before, fortunately, because we were just super dead. <laughs> what is important, I think, here to, to mention is that we had a big, um, like, uh, organizational problem, let's say, let's call it that, in the sense that our Jukari player, Crazy, couldn't come to the actual event because he has gotten, he got COVID. And the weekend prior to the event, he got COVID on some family meeting and just couldn't come, come uh, to the event, which was a uh, bad, bad news for us. And that also meant our non-playing captain Typhus, who was, uh, who's a uh, guest on this show, uh, regular guest on this show, needed to play Jukari which was not the plan, it was not the original idea, and he had to pick up the slack and play the army instead of just doing captain duties. That also meant we lost a little bit of prep time, definitely, because that he was supposed to um, definitely check out some stuff, do some uh, prep during the rounds when nobody, when we were playing, and he obviously couldn't do that playing the game himself. So that, mm -hmm. was, that was one of the troubles we came across. Yeah, but it's also very unlucky for Crazy to miss out uh, yeah, that the was... event he was essentially preparing for the past two years. That is correct. That's he's must have put in a lot of work awful. in. Yes. Well, um, hopefully next year uh, there's no more COVID or anything that can stop him. Um, so Germany were the next opponent and um, if I remember correctly, uh, because I didn't have too much time to follow WTC that closely because of family holidays and such. I think Germans had quite the off list. You've mentioned Ternets. I remember the Drakari list was also a bit, um, well, not so standard. Um, so did you get a chance to like test what they were bringing uh, or test how your armies fare against uh, their ideas? So we definitely uh, did some testing against them. They uh, brought Death Guard uh, as one of the their choices, which has become a little bit standard, but not like super meta. So we definitely wanted to uh, see how this uh, list generally performs. Some of the lists were more standard, like the Craft World's um, Hail of Doom list, which is kind of ob an obvious pick for the army or their sisters. But other than that, their Tau lists or their Tyranids Mortal Spam or their Drukari were very unorthodox. And we didn't generally have so much time to test those very specific individual um, army lists and builds against our ideas. So I think no. Uh, other than testing the general archetypes that repeated across their armies and other other teams. Okay, so um, did that affect your estimations and uh, how did the pairings go in that case? Um, this was one of the, this definitely affected our estimations a little bit, although except for the Tyranid um, lists that relied heavily on the Mortal Wounds spam, but I think it had a lot of tricks just under its uh, sleeve. Uh, we knew more or less what the lists are supposed to do. Um, the pairings opened up for us, uh, and that is that was basically the one of the reasons we uh, did so well, is because we we caught the craft words. Uh, with our Harleys. And that was a theme of this ter whole tournament that kept repeating over and over again. We are very prepared for teams to uh, trick Craftworld Elder and Hail of Doomless in general as their first defender, as their choice, the choice of table for them is very crucial. And we are very prepared to answer that with our Chaos Knights and especially with our Harlequins. Many teams fought that Harleys were actually a quite a good matchup for the Craft World Elder. Uh, and Myson, our um, esteemed 
uh, Harlequin Quinn player has proven them wrong over and over again. And this was the first example of that kind of situation where um, defending uh, first defender uh, Craftworld Eldar chose our Harlequins and got absolutely destroyed. And that will, will become a theme <laughs> you will see in the uh, in the next games. So yeah, that opened up our pairing process a lot um, because all their, our other lists generally didn't fare so well against it. For example, me and other uh, like Imperial Knights would not want to play into that list, but after that being gone and especially after we have gotten a good pairing against it, it became much, much easier. Okay, um, and uh, who did you end up playing? I played against uh, GSC, which is also very unorthodox choice uh, that not many people, um, not many teams brought. Uh, the list was a little bit interesting because it was completely custom um, cult, I think it's called. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not, think, I'm not, get, yeah, I'm so. not get cult in, uh, that good into Gene Steelers, so. I think it's a completely custom cult that played uh, heavily into missions and scoring well on pre uh, secondaries, especially. Um, because of that, I and certainly it's not being very good at just uh, outscoring their opponent on secondaries. I ended my game 13-7. I think if I had more put more time in and prepped against some specific GSC builds, I could have scored higher there. But generally, the minimum plan was achieved for me. Okay. Um, any memorable moments from that game? Any memorable moments? I remember um, just putting uh, Warriors, as I usually did, um, against these types of lists, just uh, buffing up one warrior blob and just pushing it across the table uh, to threaten my opponent. And realizing I didn't really have anything to threaten, he was so thin on the ground, especially in his deployment zone, that he just, just didn't really care about me pushing into this deployment zone and instead uh, kept blocking me on flanks with the rock grinders and stuff like that. So he played very intelligent. Uh, intelligently in that sense and then after my 5 plus invon across my whole army was gone he's just appeared from out of out of thin air and struck my whole army regaining some of his flanks so generally there was uh, no gsc on the board in like turn my turn three and then after his turn three the army was just appeared out of thin air on the board and pushed me back severely that was quite an experience. Like people couldn't judge my game, like coming to the table. Our coaches couldn't judge, couldn't tell exactly how well it is going because there was no GSC on the board. So we were probably like tabling the guy and doing a 20-0, but I knew very well that in the next turn he will probably uh, push back uh, onto me severe, like very hard, and that is exactly what happened. Okay. And uh, team-wise, you got another win. That is correct. We scored very nicely there. Um, some of the biggest scores were done up by our Necron player, which generally I think was the higher score in our team. So good job to Gido. He's the Necron specialist, I think, well known in our community especially. Mm, and beating the Craftwords was Mr. Uh, Myson. And okay. he conti continued to teach uh, how, uh, those craft with uh, some lessons during this tournament. <laughs> All right. Um, so having won that game, uh, round five, I think it's now. Uh, who did you end up playing in round five? Round five. Round five was against uh, the French. And the French did us uh, that was another, uh, let's just go with Craftworld Elder as our defender. And this time they didn't um, fall into the trap of picking Hallies. They chose our Chaos Knights, which was a much better matchup for them, but still pretty good for us. We were kind of prepared for that to happen. Mm, the pairings all went quite well. Uh, again, 
I believe uh, our our uh, Typhus playing the Drukhari list just opened the pairings, taking some of the harder ones. This time he played Salamander's list that he didn't have many tools against, but he was just supposed to score a tie. And because of that, we managed to get some really good pairings in the process, like our Tau against a Tyranid Warrior spam. Sounds familiar, because the French brought a very, very similar list to ours, uh, just even more warriors somehow. Um, but that was definitely a pairing that we wanted, especially on a very um, light table. I mean, the table had a lot of terrain on it, but it didn't really provide any covers for those warriors. Uh, so yeah, we I got myself a great opponent uh, that I've played two times previously on TDS, who was Lolo. Um, he was a complete gentleman and, and wonderful player to play against. Uh, he was playing Imperial Knights, and that was a mission 32. The problem is, on the mission 32, I started very close to your opponent, and I did manage to start that game, basically closing him off in his deployment zone for the rest of the game. Literally after the first turn, nine warriors have charged his uh, one of his knights, killing it in the process, and just blocking the, his whole army in his deployment zone which he never left for the uh, for the for the remainder of the game and after rolling quite poorly for his crusader knight in the first turn the game was kind of sealed at this point i managed to score a clean 20-0 oh that's rough that's yeah rough that was that was a super rough game for him especially the dice just punish him over and over again and still he was an absolute gentleman and he didn't get mad at all and i applaud him for the game generally and for his uh temperament and overally a great man to play against man having mentioned that i only just now remembered that dice punishing a player was usually your kind of thing <laughs> so that just... is quite of my thing and that is coming up <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That is coming oh. up. <laughs> okay. Because this was getting odd, actually, that we, you Quite, haven't right? mentioned dice I, I, uh, I kept so far. I kept talking with Lola about this, like, usually it's the other way around, man. Usually the dice are screwing me, not my opponent. And he was like, well, apparently not this time, man. <laughs> <laughs> and um, how did you... Feel going into the game with the French guys because I mean uh, you've played them on TTS on quite a number of occasions if I remember correctly and it was not always necessarily a win for you guys. Uh, I think we played against them um, three or maybe even four times uh, on our TTS scrims but um, all with different teams. We tested oh. uh, along the, the selection process. We tested a lot of people, people who wanted to, wanted to test themselves in this kind of international environment and playing an international team. Uh, so we, I think, we definitely won a couple of those and maybe drew and maybe uh, lost one, but that wasn't necessarily with like our A team and some of mm -hmm. the people that were just less experienced, for example. Generally, we were confident. They had some of um, some nice ideas across their lists and some threatening ones. Uh, especially, I like the Salamanders list. I think it was undervalued across our pairing, like um, our estimation tables. I think it was very good against, for example, knights. I would not want to play uh, uh, into that, especially uh, seeing so many rural wounds against my turn is just makes me completely fucking anxious. So that was one of the pairings I was trying really hard to dodge. Mm. But I think some of their lists we didn't uh, like expect to do well and they didn't really do well. Like we were very much prepared for the Tyranids list because it was very similar to ours, but it had, uh, let's just be honest here. I think it had wrong hyper adaptation. It had a uh, hyper adaptation for plus one to charge across his whole army. Well, whilst I was running uh, the hyper adaptation that allows you to ignore all of the modifiers to advance, charge, and move, which I think on the WTC tables and with armies like Chaos Knights around, I think it's absolutely superior. Uh, 
generally there were a couple of interesting ideas across uh, the list, as I've said, but we were prepared for them. Okay. Uh, okay. So day two, uh, another two wins. Um, what was the morale like, and uh, you know the attitude in general in the team? I think we felt validated that day. Me generally, after especially now we had time to talk, to to grab something to eat as a group, to feel like a proper team, and uh, the morale was high that day. We actually defeated two teams uh, very like handedly and had big advantages over them in the scoring. Um, so we felt really prepared and knew that we actually can make it. After the spin bump with Belgium, I think this was finally the moment that we realized that we actually are really well prepared, we are ready for this, and we can make it. Okay, so what was your attitude knowing that the next morning you're playing the US team? At which we quite often used to throw feces at, on, on this channel here. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that was definitely psychologically the hardest matchup. I'm going to be completely honest. That was the only matchup that I felt kind of anxious before. Uh, we know that the most of their players were really good individual. Like their individual skill was very high. Their lists were kind of unorthodox, and we kind of well were prepared for them. But at the same time, the the the, the pressure was definitely on. I could I can only speak for myself, but that was definitely the evening that I had the most trouble falling asleep. And uh, before the game, we we did a lot of prep actually in the evening after after getting something to eat and um, talking and grabbing a beer. We spent at least three and a half hours just double checking all of our estimation tables if they are correct, bumping anything that we don't we are not sure about, um, just triple checking and and thinking about uh, what our defender uh, is and what the general plan for the pairing is. Okay, and uh, did that bring any results in the pairing process? Well, yes. I mean, um, what is interesting, I think, here is how the Team USA paired, and we generally managed to scout them out during the event. The like looking at other um, other teams' pairing process was completely off the of the table. It was completely illegal. It was an instant red card if you. Uh, try to spy on other teams during their pairing process. So we absolutely didn't do that. But we could see how their paired, uh, how their pairings ended with uh, when they play against Team England or other teams the previous day. So what we've noticed is that they usually tend to grab some medium to bad matchups in the beginning, and then slowly opening the table for them to just grab the big. Uh, scores at the at the pit. Let's say that's how we generally call it, uh, the pit. So last three or four matchups on the last tables that are present, right? These generally are kind of random because they all uh, depend on what uh, the team was going to put up as the defender and what this they are going to left as their champion. So what they really focused on was having that pit secured. So no matter what happened there, instead of there being kind of random, they only had good matchups coming into that. And uh, during the pairing process, they would uh, sometimes open up the table by grabbing some uh, unfavorable matchups, matchups that they really, really think, I don't really think they wanted to win, but that they wanted to at least draw, and then having that pit really secured. And I think they did the same, a similar thing with England, and they tried to do the same thing with us. The very big difference here is we had Harlequins very much prepared for, again, Craft World Eldar. <laughs> um, as I said, it was a theme, and I think it is something that definitely allowed us to do as well as we did in this tournament, just uh, having that. Uh, pairing flipped. So again, 
their first defender was crafted Erdar. Our attackers were Chaos Knights and Harlequins. And Rochester took the Harlequins. And he scored a big fat zero on that. <laughs> I really don't think he was just prepared to to face the types of type of play by Hallies that Myson proposed to him. And he just surprised him with that. Um, so our Harleys just demolished the Craftworld Elder. We had some matchups that definitely went uh, USA's way. For example, uh, their Admech piloted by uh, Richard Siegler got our Renegade Knights. Um, their Custodies piloted by John Lennon got our Sisters, which also were a preferable matchups. And their Tau got uh, our Knights, actually. So they had definitely three big matchups going for them. And we had three big matchups going for us. I was playing against Blood Angels as it was my preferable matchup. We had uh, our Tau player Skark, who is an absolute legend, uh, attended every single, single ETC previously. Um, up to this point, he was playing Necrons on an open table at Necrons that had pretty much no shooting. We had uh, our Necrons against the Sisters. Basically, the, spe the pairings were split in half between there was very little like mid matchups and that was there was a lot of just completely bad or very good matchups. What I think happened here are a couple of things. Our Knights actually won with um, the American Tau, which is something that just nobody expected to, to see. Uh, from what I've heard from the stories uh, that were are going to probably get told many many times, is that the the list that uh, Jack Harpster had, it only had two hammerheads, and he just whiffed with them, and because of that and putting his planes into the reserve turn one after the night started, he actually didn't have enough firepower to throw through the the knights. And after those Raygon missed and the uh, crisis suits that were very light on defense and on shield drones and on uh, shields themselves uh, jumped in front of the knights, they just get churned. So after that situation and not losing a single knight the first turn, um, he just demolished uh, the crisis suits and continued into the tower deployment zone. Good stuff. Yep. So that was quite a quite a huge one to flip on on them. Uh, however, my matchup didn't go according to plan. For example, I was expecting to win uh, big against uh, Blood Angels, or at least win like a 13-14. I was uh, estimated sparring for. I didn't start, for example, um, and the great Sean Naden showed me how to roll actual dice. Uh, rushed me with his death company and killed a measly 12 warriors on the charge. Which was a problem, <laughs> to say the least. My transhuman didn't really um, activate, I guess, here. So with his 12, uh, he very smartly split the attacks across two warrior blobs. One of them got minus one damage, but the blob that didn't get minus one damage uh, from those 12 attacks hitting on 3+, plus, rolling and then wounding on 4+, plus, well, he killed exactly 9 warriors. So that was a blob just gone. I think I calculated that after the game and before the game as well, and he should kill like 7, and he killed uh, a nice fat 12 warriors, which was one of the blobs just gone off the board, and definitely that hampered my ability to actually score big and win the game. Um, that was a kind of kind of a game that I was fearing is going to come up. So the one in which my transhuman just doesn't work right; it just doesn't do its job. Um, so that was something that we were kind of expecting to happen at some point. It is it, that was a very mathematical list, and if that math somehow some sometimes it just somehow fails you, uh, you don't have a lot of counterplay for that. I fortunately managed to scrap out and. Uh, 9 to 11 drawish result after all, because actually transhuman can work apparently, but I didn't have enough uh, push 
and damage in t in my list left to push the blood angels off the board as was the original plan. Okay, um, and how did the others fare? I mean, uh, it's no secret that you've won the game as a team. We did, we did. I think we scored like 95 points. Uh, Skark demolished uh, Mark Perry's uh, Necrons, 19 to 1. We scored a little, uh, a, a small lose on our Drakari side, so very much as expected. And our Necron player, Gito, uh, ate some sisters for a nice dinner, for a nice breakfast, sorry. So generally, we won that, but it could have been really close, basically. Oh, congrats on the win then. And uh, after that, you are going into the final with Australia. Um, who again had some unorthodox lists, which was part of the reason why I asked at the time we are discussing Germany. So um, did you get a chance to test some of their ideas prior to the event? I think Australia brought one of the most unorthodox builds. I don't think any uh, any particular list I would classify it as uh, standard in any sense of the of the word. I think all of them had at least something about them that got completely changed or like switching 500 points around. I think they are proud of, of and, and often talked about how they um, take that basic archetype list and just swap things around so the prep is not uh, relevant when coming up against them. And that was very much the case. Uh, we straight up didn't have enough time, I think, to prep against those very specific lists. And with the limited time after the Nephilim changes and generally just living our lives as normal so going to work and having families and stuff we didn't we definitely didn't have enough prep into those specific lists to assess them properly and i think what it came down to is um misunderstanding some of the matchups that we probably were coming uh, up against and mm, underestimating some of the the pairings i think it's the our loss because I think it's not a big secret that we lost that game. Uh, came down to that, yes. To being underprepared for those very specific uh, lists that they just practiced a shitload and they were masters at. Okay, and uh, how did your game specifically go? Uh, my game was against Tau, so this time I was a little bit thrown under the bus, but that was kind of expected. Also, I really thought that uh, their Tau list uh, was kind of unorthodox as well. That was no hammerheads in there, and not many crisis suits. Instead, uh, the gentleman Hayden, which was absolutely, again, which is the case with all of my opponents actually, was just amazing player to play against. He had four commanders, three Colster that is, and an enforcer, enforcer uh, commander in there on all Farsight enclaves. And those commanders, let me tell you, they still pack a punch. And I think I generally underestimated how much of a punch they can um, just deal so much damage. <laughs> that just coming out of those four characters. Uh, after starting that game and pushing into the uh, middle of the board, I got blocked with the typical complete line of junk, like crude hounds, uh, some breachers, some drones, even like three, two bodyguard units with some um, drones to just not allow me to continue my journey into his deployment zone and thinning me out. And after that first line was brought down, I thought I actually might make it after losing, I think like seven or nine warriors in the first turn, seven or eight, sorry. Um, but then the counterpunch struck me. And the counterpunch, including uh, breachers with rolling auto wound, the commanders, and the crisis is coming around from uh, the deep strikes, as long as, as uh, along with the planes, just wiped me off the floor. I think I started my third turn with five warriors left on the board. So that was 31 uh, turned warriors on a turn with 
uh, five plus Invan on them, just completely off the table. I think they have the hey they had that pairing very well calculated. I absolutely didn't expect this to to win that matchup coming into that, but I think I thought I could score like an eight, uh, maybe a nine if I started. Uh, turned out I could only do a six. And that was my final call after wiping those warriors in those basically three turns. That was a scribe fight mm, for some last ditch objectives, banners, and stuff like this. And the final score was a 14 to 6 to Mr. Hayden. Well, and uh, congrats to Australia for winning the event altogether. Very much so. Credit where credit is due. They did amazing stuff. I think the, their lists were incredibly well designed. They played them a shitload, and that was very visible during this entire event and on the table uh, while playing them. And generally, good job to them. Congratulations. Okay, so um, we've spoken about the games. Uh, I asked you what were your thoughts about the event and uh, the general idea of playing in a team, but um, what are your outtakes from the event? What do you think of uh, your performance, the team performance? And uh, yeah, maybe let's stop there for now. <laughs> uh, so my performance, I think... I would I would say I am kind of satisfied with my performance. I think I did a lot of prep. I think I was ready for most of what happened during that event. Uh, I didn't think I made a lot of mistakes playing definitely, but that must be said, my list was not very complicated to play and to actually make mistakes. So that was a very that was something that definitely helped me be confident in 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 type of game I had. Um, about the team, I think the team generally did an amazing job. I think it was, I don't even remember and I don't think it would have been possible to, to spend more time preparing for the event, but at the same time I feel like it is the only thing we could have done better. It's even more prep, whereas giving even more time into the hobby might have been just insane to even think about yes and i think if we if there was a, a reason why we didn't win the event i would think we didn't have enough prep which is again insane to even think of thinking just how many hundreds of hours went into the preparation before the thing itself so um, outtakes from from that and and probably for the next years i think the game itself has changed quite a bit I think for after after that um, period that the ETC didn't and the WTC didn't happen because of COVID, I think many countries just caught on and developed their teams very well, having a lot of prep and just generally the level of play has significantly increased. I think the, the skill itself is just not enough to just carry you across the line and what you need is hours upon hours of prep time thinking about your list, playing against your opponent, list, stuff like this. Okay, and um, to keep in line with the credit where credit is due theme, um, I think you deserve quite a bit of credit because uh, being thrown on that Tyranid, even if not too demanding uh, list, uh, you've had like what less than six weeks to actually get it mastered. I think I learned I was playing that specific list, and that was our final choice, four days before the list deadline. <laughs> Basically, yes. And uh, what was the list deadline uh, date? Uh, I wish I remembered. I think it was 15th of uh, July? 15th of July, I believe, so yes. So like a month before the event. Nice. So yeah, well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, so what are your plans for the future in terms of 40k? Um, are you fed up uh, playing the game, playing the 
brain dead um, list or have you got something on your mind already? That is, I really thought after playing so many goddamn games of 40k last couple of months that I would be just completely burned out and uh, I would want to take a break from the game and it just turned out to be completely untrue. <laughs> uh, during our flight back I think I just started making my first lists and thinking about why, what I actually want to play for the next couple of months. Um, the Polish team championship is coming up next uh, month, right? I think mm -hmm. it's next month. Uh, so I already have a, uh, a, a team build in mind or at least a couple of lists that my mates from Krakow are going to be playing and we gathered a team to uh, hopefully go for top three during that event. So generally back on the track, <laughs> I think incredibly fast. And I think it's been a theme when I talk to uh, to the mates from the team that the general consensus is we're just back at work, <laughs> back to the normal schedule um, and need to keep chugging along. And hopefully after uh, another year of just try harding and, and keeping up with the meta and doing well at events, um, we just might uh, get another chance to come to WTC. Yep, and fingers crossed that uh, if we do this next year, we're in more celebratory modes than today. <laughs> I mean, so it is it is kind of, that's the most Polish thing I've ever heard, right? <laughs> because you're never satisfied with the second place. I think it's a very common thing in sports, by the way, and I think I I really felt that, especially uh, after the event itself, like a couple of hours after the event, that the Germans who took the uh, third place, by the way, amazing team to play against, uh, awful lads and congratulations for their achievement, were so happy to be on the podium. And the Australians obviously were just incredibly happy to take the first place. And we were kind of happy, but kind of down because we had, um, we were just so close to actually winning, right? I think it's it's an actual um, psychological phenomenon that happens in sports. Yeah, yeah, I mean, fully agree. Second and fourth is probably the worst place to have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will take the second above the fourth. <laughs> well, I think I'm surely. Still way, way more satisfied with that result. And uh, generally for, for, for a team that started, that had five new players in it, I think for most of us, it's still a big success to come this close to the the first place. No, it's definitely a great achievement and I never in my mind uh, did I want to undermine it. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, the aim was number one, wasn't it? So yeah, the aim is always number one for us. <laughs> exactly. So And it's uh, going to be so next year, I believe. And on that positive note, uh thanks for coming in that was very insightful thank you very much for having me and uh yep yeah, well that was pumba from the polish wtc national team and i was joker hosting this interview so uh thanks everyone for tuning in and remember to like subscribe on whatever else you can do to follow us social medias help us grow and uh of course, if you like our content. Uh, so thanks everyone and goodbye. Bye bye everyone.